All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined just up the coast in Vancouver and British Columbia by Suzanne Jabor. How are you doing, Suzanne? I'm well, thank you. Yes, it's actually sunny Vancouver today as well, which is not as normal for us as it is for you in San Diego. Oh, well, that's fantastic. And um, Suzanne's a grieving mother who found meaning in her loss, providing grief education, sharing how grief really works and how we can support people experiencing it. She works with organizations and businesses to build skills and protocols to better support people who are grieving at work. She's available as a speaker to share her story, help normalize grief as a healthy response. She has a BA and BE and B Ed and decades of experience as a trainer, certified grief educator, transformation coach, and workshop leader. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the importance of compassion, compassionate leadership and emotional intelligence. And I guess, um, Suzanne, you know, not that I want to you know, these drag up these painful memories, but you you got into this area because of the traumatic loss you had of your son. So just just explain to me, how did you manage to turn something so traumatic that something like I said to you before we came on air, something that nobody else can relate to unless they've experienced it. How did you turn that into, into something positive? I mean, it happened, I, I, to me it felt very gradual though when I look back at the timeline, I was speaking publicly and you know doing podcasts and doing presentations for businesses very soon after Ben died. Um, and really it was a couple of things. I was very, very clear almost instantly that this was not gonna be for nothing. Mm -hmm. That there, you know, I really, I don't believe that things happen for a reason, but I do believe that things happen and then we get to choose how we respond to them and what we do next. And I really discovered for my own survival that we don't know enough about grief. We don't understand it well enough. And I had to become a student of it for my own survival, literally, because I didn't understand what was happening to me physiologically, with my memory, with my you know inability to complete sentences, you know, all <laughs> kinds of things happened to me that I wasn't expecting. So you find yourself in the situation where you're deeply in despair over the loss of your loved one and you don't know who you are anymore and you don't understand what's happening to your body and your brain and your ability to eat, sleep and function. And mm -hmm. all of that happens because we have such a taboo about grief and we don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And if only we could talk about it and share those experiences. And then as we're gonna focus on today, respond with compassion and lead with compassion, we would all know better what was, you know, what we could maybe possibly expect and we would understand grief enough to be able to really show up to support people because mm -hmm. when we don't know anything about something and we feel scared of it, which is how our culture at the moment is around grief, mm -hmm. it's very, very hard to show up for someone in the way that they need you to because right. it automatically others the other person. They're that mm -hmm. scary thing that you don't want to think about, right? And, yeah. you know, I have people say to me all the time, oh, I have kids, I can't even imagine what that would be like. And it's a yes and, you know, yes, you can't imagine. And I'm, and I say to people all the time, I'm so thrilled that you can't. I don't wish this yeah, journey yeah. on anybody, mm -hmm. but it's my journey. And I was really clear that, you know, the story we're told of grieving parents where they kind of curl up in a ball and are never seen again, that was not going to be my story. Right. And that, you know, this, there had to be something good come out of this tragic mm -hmm. loss that because could help people. Yeah, because I mean, let's face it. I mean, none of us, none of us are taught how to grieve, right? And we come, and we all come with our own kind of lived experiences and our own cultural backgrounds. Like I'm originally Irish. We, uh, we love, you know, we do death very well in terms of, you know, yes. funerals and wakes and all of that. But in terms of knowing how to grieve, that's completely beyond our capability. We have no idea how to do that, and and so right. I think that's we can that, have it, the party, and then it's supposed to all be done. And then it's supposed to all be done. And then it's like, I don't know how I'm supposed to react, how I'm supposed to feel and all of that. And I guess that's which brings your work really sharply into focus because that's the that's pretty much everybody, right? You know, regardless of where they come, nobody is taught or taught how to grieve. No. And, and because we don't talk about it, we're not learning from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no curricula in school and we don't talk to each other about it. So we're all kind of blindly bumbling about. And what ends up happening is we end up feeling very isolated. You know, for me, I was really 
realized that, you know, I'm grieving Ben because he's gone and no longer here. And I'm grieving myself because I know the person who I was before that phone rang and the person I was after that phone rang are never going to be the same person. Mm -hmm. And I was terrified by all of the things that were happening to me that I didn't know to expect. You know, and, and when I look back at it and I look back at when my father died, when my dad died, so many of the symptoms that I have studied and learned about for my own survival and experienced, I see them now as what happened to my mom. And wow. I remember having conversations with my brothers and being like, what on earth is going on with her? Like, she can't make a decision. She's doing all this crazy stuff. Like, she doesn't ever know what day it is. Like, I didn't get it until mm -hmm. I had those kind of symptoms myself. And we didn't have a relationship where she talked about it. I think she right. was trying, you know, she understood so well that we're grieving our dad and she didn't want to burden us, right? We have so many stories about how grief is a burden. It's just a normal, healthy response to loss. And yeah. if we can get ourselves over the shoulds, the burden, the guilt, the shame, and we can have a conversation about it as we're modeling today, mm -hmm. it's a normal part of our life. It's the only thing that's guaranteed, one of the few that we're guaranteed to live through. Mm -hmm. Because people, the, grieve, people die. It's yeah. a guarantee. So but, let's but also, do better. But also, uh, we, I mean, that that's obviously the the most, uh, you know, the highest form of grief, if you like. But I mean, there's grief in other areas of life. Like we can, Absolutely. we don't know, you, you, maybe you, you lose your job tomorrow or something. You yeah. don't re you don't really know how to grieve for that part of your life that's over or, you know, relationship end or things like that. So we don't, we don't know how to deal with that. And I guess from the work you're doing, this is all, people at work are going through all these different emotions, right? Different levels yeah. of issues and, and maybe different levels of grief. And that's not something as leaders that we're prepared or, or trained or we know how no. to deal with. We're more or less like, oh, I don't know what to do with this situation. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly that. And, you know, I don't know what to do with this situation and I don't want to do any harm. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to back slowly away and hope for the best. Yeah. Right. <laughs> really is kind of where we've ended up. And what's so interesting, and I love that you've identified how grief happens for all kinds of loss. We really benefit from that broadened understanding. Yes, it happens for the death of a loved one, for sure. Pet loss, job loss, business loss, relationship loss, even changes that are positive have grief attached to them, right? Because sure. change means you're leaving something behind. And what makes me excited about understanding it that way is there's all kinds of rich opportunities there to practice the skills that we need to develop together. Mm -hmm. Because if I can show up with compassion, right? So for me, compassion is a step along the path from sympathy to empathy to compassion. So sympathy is I feel sorry for you. Most mm -hmm. of us have moved past that, right? We're realizing that's not terribly helpful. Right. Lots of us are working on empathy, right? I can put myself in your shoes. I can imagine what that might be like. I have a similar experience I can extend. Compassion then is taking that empathy and putting it into action. I understand on, in a way, or I can imagine what you might be going through, and I really actually want to help. So how can I help carry this burden? How can I help alleviate pressure at work? How can I help with your task list? How can I help you remember what day it is, right? Right. And there's all kinds of really simple ways that we can step up for people that we can practice on all of those other losses so that when the big catastrophic ones happen, we have a little bit more comfort, right? We have tried mm -hmm. our skills. We have a little bit more of an ability to say something awkward, but open-hearted, and, you know, it gives us then the opportunity to really step up for someone like me, who's a grieving mom grieving out loud. I'm not a good first assignment. Like if you mm -hmm. have never had an awkward conversation about grief, I mean, I was an okay first assignment because I was very comfortable talking about it. I right. had to just survive. Mm -hmm. But most people in that catastrophic rupture, they're not, that's not a place for you to practice, right? right. We don't get our driver's license and go drive across the country. Exactly. We get our driver's license and we try and get to the corner store without hitting anything. And then we get better and better and better, right? Yeah. But we, with grief, are like, we're starting out with the road trip. We need to start out with the trip to the corner store. How can we help people in other kinds of grief? And how can we look at our organizations and find the grief happening there, right? Mm -hmm. When's the last time you restructured? The average is every three to five years. Right. Every time you've restructured, you've created grief in your workplace for those who leave and those who stay. Yeah, right? yeah. When did you last launch a product that didn't go the way you wanted? There's all kinds of grief there, but we're not talking about it with that lens. So if we can start there, then we're yeah. doing that culture shift. Then we're stepping forward as compassionate leaders. We're modeling 
honesty, a little bit of vulnerability, and that creates safety for other people to do the same. Mm -hmm. I like what you said, though, about that thing about even at, at the very fundamental level is just asking the person how you can help them like what can you yeah. do and that takes a level of obviously emotional intelligence a little bit of humility mm -hmm. but just to say you know i may be your manager i may be the leader of the organization i may be whatever but i'm i'm not qualified for this right now i don't know how so i need yeah. your help in order to help you as best i can and whatever that is that's fine yeah, and I think what's really interesting is the most helpful thing we can do for grievers is offer really specific things. Mm -hmm. So you could offer, you know, hybrid work if the person's not already hybrid working. You could offer flexible work hours if that's possible. You could offer, you know, technical support that remind that has reminders attached where you've documented um, steps in a project, for example. There's all kinds of things that we can do that really help, particularly with the brain fog. That's the thing that shows up the most robustly mm. at work. Most of us can manage to sort of get ourselves dressed and get ourselves there. And then when we're there, we're in such a fog that we barely know what's happening. So how can we help? How can we say, well, you know, we have a meeting at two o'clock. Do you want me to pop into your office at quarter two to just remind you? So then you don't have to worry about when it is. You know, I'm gonna, I've got that mm. covered for you. It's right. things that are that simple, right? Super yeah. simple, but they build connection instead of right now what's happening is we're creating isolation yeah. and we want that well, person engaged they're a valued part of our team it's really expensive to replace them <laughs> yeah and we and like we said earlier we instinctively maybe you know say well maybe i should just maybe i should just give suzanne a lot of space and maybe i yeah. should just let her and then and then you get to that awkward thing of well, it's been a little while now. Should I raise this subject? Should I pretend, you know, she, you know, what, what do I do? Because I don't want to be, I don't want it to be every time I talk to you going, how are you, you know, how are you doing? Because I'm not sure whether right. that's the right thing to do. So I guess there's all these things that we, we, that we struggle with. And then we just go, best just not to say anything. Yeah. And the problem is that for people, especially in the acute early days, they're consumed. It really is the lens. I used to describe it to people by saying that I kind of felt like I was moving through the world with a sheer curtain in front of me that had Ben's face on it. Mm -hmm. And everything I interacted with, everything I did happened on the other side of that curtain. So think about how that operationalizes for someone in your business that has to show up and get stuff done. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Yeah, yeah. And I managed and I had really great support from my direct supervisor beyond him useless like nobody knew what to do or say and they said all kinds of awkward horrible things <laughs> with the best of intentions but we don't sure. know any better and i really got to the point where i just would listen for the energy like what okay what is their heart saying oh their heart is saying they care about me and they wish they knew what to say and their mm. mouth is saying something awful <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> right but i think what happens you know when with the best of intentions we kind of step back and we want to give that person space is they end up feeling alone and misunderstood mm. and they end up withdrawing and what we want is for people to stay connected as best they're able to the degree they're able and to reintegrate them, right? To keep welcoming them back, to keep saying like, you matter here. We're in this for the long haul. You know, it, wouldn't it be refreshing to say to someone after they've come back from their three to five days off, instead of pretending they're all done, saying to them, you know, like I've done a little bit of listening to this great podcast about grief. And now I understand like, this is really gonna likely be impacting you for the next couple of years. Yeah. So how do we plan for that, right? Mm -hmm. What do you need today? Let's talk about what can we do today? And then let's have a regular touch base every couple of weeks until we yeah. can space it out to every month. And then you know there's a time set aside for that conversation. So no one feels pressured that every conversation has to be about that, right? We right. know when that conversation is coming, we can prepare ourselves, we can be in the right headspace for it. We can know this is our, you know, we all have moments where we're amazingly compassionate and we all have moments where we just want to punch each other in the throat. That's normal, <laughs> right? But we know when yeah. we're having that meeting, we want to come compassionate. We want to come open-hearted. Uh -huh. And then we kind of can have an ebb and flow and that person feels connected. Yeah. They feel valued. They feel seen and heard. And that's overwhelmingly what people are looking for in a workplace. Yeah. And like you said earlier as well, is that we need to look at this on a, on a broader level in terms yeah. of everything that, because let's face it, we do, if we do say there's a, there's a restructuring or a downsizing or whatever mm -hmm. we, you know, we build up to, and, and I've done, I've done too many in my life, you know, to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest, you know, it's never fun. And especially because 
if it's a if it's a if it's a restructuring because of economic conditions or something, you yeah. often end up having to let go people who are doing a good job. They've done nothing wrong. They're just yeah. the ones that unfortunately you found a way to live without them. And you get through that, you try to do it as compassionately as possible. But you're right, you don't you we never really come back and sort of we sort of go with the organization, okay, yeah, everybody seems fine. Okay, let's just move on. But yeah. we don't we don't acknowledge the fact that the people left behind may have like survivor's guilt, if you like. A hundred percent. They have survivor's guilt. And we don't know who the people who've left are to them, right? Yeah. Maybe that's their lunch buddy. Maybe that's the person they always talk to at the water cooler. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's someone they have regular meetings with. Maybe the restructure means some of the people that remain change teams. Mm -hmm. So they may have a completely different job with completely different people. Yeah, so yeah. you've disrupted their identity, their social connections everything is disrupted and you know we can imagine how that would be different if someone in a leadership position said you know what that's been really hard i want you to understand those were painful decisions for us to make if you can say that genuinely right you have yeah, to yeah. be genuine you have sure. to be no, authentic absolutely. right don't don't absolutely. quote this because it sounded like a good <laughs> idea right but something like that and then where you're saying you know we're so grateful to have been able to keep all of you and you're so important to us and we know that there's grief happening right now. We know you might be feeling uncomfortable because someone who left you think is as yeah. good at your job or better. Mm -hmm. And so how come they're gone and you're here? But we're here together. We're going to figure it out. And, you know, I have a whole bunch of emotions about that. I have a whole bunch of feelings about what's going on. And I feel name two of them, right? I feel really excited about what's coming in the future and really sad we had to let people go. And I want to be sure that you all know how much you matter to me. Mm. If yeah. anyone else has something they want to share, this is a safe place to do that, right? We can model from the leadership. Yeah. And then that starts to create that safe place where we can talk about emotions at work. And I'm not suggesting that we get out of control or that <laughs> anyone is their therapist or any yeah. of that. But what we do know from the research is if, even if we can just name those emotions, that helps move them. Yeah. So just the naming is really powerful. And if you can have, I was talking to someone yesterday and we were talking about how really every office should have both a quiet room and a smash room. And a smash room. So if room, you could yeah. have like a quiet room and a smash room, <laughs> excellent. Yeah. But most of us, that's not the reality, yeah. right? But I think I know which space. one I'd be, I know which one I'd be using more, I think, but. Uh... More often, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's just I, I have to say I'm all about the smash room myself. <laughs> 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 but, but yeah, no, I think you need the quiet space. You just need to yeah. go and be able to take a breath. You know, we have it in kindergarten. We have it in preschool. And then yeah. we get into business and corporate <laughs> and we're just all supposed to not have those kind of emotions anymore. Yeah, we need absolutely. to accept that we have them all. We can name absolutely. them without being out of control. We can talk about them without them overtaking the conversation yeah. and naming them keeps them moving, which is healthy for all of us. And I guess, too, like this issue is exacerbated somewhat now because of the way work is configured. You have remote people who are virtual or remote, people who you may never see face to face or very rarely. Yeah. And then so so that that is even a bigger challenge. Like, how do you, you know, deal with somebody in a compassionate way through the screen or through the phone or whatever? I mean, how do you do that? You just do. Mm. <laughs> I think what's really interesting and what I've really come to see from, you know, pre-March of 2020, when I had no idea what Zoom, that Zoom existed to days like right. today, where I think I've been on Zoom since about eight o'clock this morning, <laughs> you know, you really can have meaningful connection and meaningful conversations. We're doing it right now mm -hmm. in what I fondly refer to as the Hollywood squares. Right. And it does take a level of awareness, right? We all have to get really good at reading body language from kind of the shoulders up because we don't <laughs> have that whole, you know, full body withdrawal when someone's yep. upset about something, but you can get the nuance and you can feel the energy and I think that we're far more skilled at it than we've given ourselves credit for. And we've had to learn it really fast, right? Mm -hmm. Humans can adapt pretty quickly when we have to. And I very rarely am in an online sphere where it feels like everyone's disconnected and nobody really knows what's mm -hmm. happening. It just yeah. doesn't seem to happen that often. So it's super interesting to me that I think as leaders, we're all really aware of that and we're really cognizant, which I think is brilliant because everything that we do intentionally is so much more powerful. And if we're intentionally creating those virtual spaces so everyone feels welcome and everyone has a voice, then I really think we can have these deep, meaningful connections in a virtual space. I talk to people all over the world. Yeah, no, I, How I, thrilling I, and exciting is that, right? No, I, you I, and I would never have had an interaction 
if we weren't able to do it virtually. No, ab absolutely. But I think probably, though, the one thing that it does change a little is that you probably have to be a lot more intentional, but a lot more intentional yeah. about the remote person. Because obviously, if I see you in the office, I'm reminded, whatever. But if you're out of sight, out of mind, I've got to make sure intentionally that I'm checking in. Yeah, I think it's really easy if everyone's remote or if everybody's there. Right. <laughs> but now most of us have some kind of hybrid where either we're there part time and not there sometimes or some people are always here. Some people are never here. I think we're going to get really good at scheduling, mm -hmm. I think, is what's going to be the answer that we have regular. Yeah. And when I talk to leaders that are operating in those kind of systems, that's what they've done. Right. I have a Thursday check in every morning or, you know, every week with my team or we always meet on Tuesdays for lunch or coffee or whatever it is but they have found ways to create those regular touch points with individual employees and team members and with the team as a whole. And it, it, it is really gonna be about scheduling because otherwise mm -hmm. you're right, we don't cross each other, we don't pass each other in the hall, we don't mm -hmm. see each other at the coffee machine. So you do need to have that systematization, it, not to make it sound cold and sure. you know, yucky, but it does kind of need to be a system. Yeah. And so um, just one last question. What was uh, early on, what was one thing that somebody said or did for you early on that you thought, yeah, oh, finally somebody is understanding where I am or, or that was great. I, I really needed that. I mean, there's so many things people did well and even more that they did poorly. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, what I get asked the most is, you know, what can I say? What can I do? And certainly from a business perspective, there's all kinds of things. We've talked about a whole bunch of them. For me, one of the most meaningful things that happened was someone on my team, I was in a supervisory position when Ben died and someone on my team um, came to me in the parking lot because it was during COVID. So of course we're all like, can't, you can only talk six feet from each other outside <laughs> and all the rules. And she said, you know, I never met him. And I would love for you to tell me one thing that you really loved about him that you wish we all knew. Wow. And that was such a beautiful way to say, like, I didn't know him, but I know you and I care. You know, the subtext of that was so rich and lovely and such a contrast to the subtext of people who said things like, you know, I'm so sorry. Uh, not that I'm so sorry is bad, but it's not a complete mm. thought. It's a good sure. opening phrase. And then you need to say <laughs> something more genuine. But I just thought that was the, I, I'll never forget her standing in the parking lot and saying, oh, my gosh, like, I just. I can't even really understand or comprehend what's happened. And I didn't even know him. And like, I would love for you to share something with me that you wish we all knew about him. Uh, it was that, just a really magical moment. Yeah, and it takes a little bit of, that takes a little bit of bravery. That's very well done to that person. It, because it takes that, a lot of bravery, yeah. right? And to say that to your supervisor, right? Mm. I, this is one of my direct reports. She's saying that to her supervisor. Yeah. And I just thought, wow, you are braver and kinder than I ever imagined. Yeah, no, that's great. In Ireland, we would yeah. just say, we would just say, I'm sorry for your troubles. Yeah. <laughs> no, so pleasure. what I will encourage you, you know, here's your homework. You get to hold on to that. Yeah. I'm sorry for your troubles. And. Yeah. Because the next part is the juice. Yeah, absolutely. No, and that's what I will. I will take that on board myself. Thank you for that. I'll make sure next time I use the old Irish phrase, sorry for your troubles, I'll make sure there's an and after it and there's something yeah. meaningful. And then something genuine from your heart. That's all we need, right? Yeah. There's something genuine, awkward. It's going to be awkward. It's a new skill set we're learning. Sure. It's going to be awkward. Oh, well. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Suzanne, this has been fascinating. I mean, we could talk for a long time. I mean, this is such a such an important subject because, like it's uh, like you know, we've talked about here, grief is a, is a is a spectrum, if you like. It's a much broader topic than than, than just the catastrophic grief. Um, all of Suzanne's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. What I uh, do is sort of threefold. I love working with grievers. So if you have someone in your organization who's really struggling and just cannot kind of find their way, I love helping grievers chart their own path. And working with organizations, it's really wonderful to come in and do, you know, a workshop about grief, you know, grief 101, I call it. Let's all learn mm -hmm. about it so we're not so scared. And right. then let's look at what the policy could be, right? If you have a return to work policy from an injury, let's put one together that's a return to work policy for someone who's grieving serves a bunch of purposes, right? It makes you stand out as a company that actually does care about their people. They don't just yeah. talk about it. And for all the supervisors, director, you know, people who are supervising someone, managing people, team leaders, all the way up to the C-suite, it gives you a tool to use in that first awkward conversation because you're going to yeah. have to have some awkward conversations and that gives you a tool to use. So we can set up 
you know, it's all bespoke. I sort of do an assessment with you of your organization and then we put a program together. And to me, that's the sweetest spot of my work because that's where I have the biggest impact. And mm -hmm. the purpose of what I do is to shift the conversation, to change the paradigm that we're in now. And the biggest place I can do that is to come into a workplace and help shift that one space, one space at a time. Yeah, fantastic. Well, listen, I would encourage everybody to go check it out. This is a very, very important area. And thank you so much, Suzanne, today for, for sharing those insights. And thank you for the work that you do, because, you know, there's a lot of people who would have just, as you said, kind of gone away and hid in the corner, but you turned it into something in, very impactful and, and very positive. So thank you so much for sharing today. Thank you for watching and listening.